Welcome to Ultrasound Simplified. This presentation provides a general overview of basic ultrasound principles, instrumentation, Doppler, applications, and does not constitute professional medical advice or a complete course of training. You should not perform ultrasound evaluations and procedures solely in reliance upon the information in this presentation. In this presentation, we will be examining the definition of ultrasound, how it works using simple terms, the term echogenicity and how it applies to our ultrasound display, key points to assist us in creating ultrasound images, and the various modes available on the Cosmos platform. Ultrasound is defined as mechanical pressure waves that are transmitted and received through a medium. Air, blood, water, soft tissue are all mediums. It's measured in hertz or cycles per second. Audible sound typically ranges between 20 to 20,000 hertz or 20 to 20,000 cycles per second. Ultrasound is technically defined as frequencies in excess of that 20,000 hertz. Diagnostic ultrasound typically operates at approximately 2 to 18 million cycles per second or 2 to 18 megahertz. Ultrasound works on something called the pulse echo principle. The transducer or the torso is the source of the high frequency sound, and we'd like to think that it emits this big block of acoustic energy. The reality is the sound beam is approximately one millimeter in thickness or about the same thickness as a credit card. Now the transducer is electrically pulsed. The piezoelectric crystals produce sound which propagate through the tissue. Those echoes reflect back to the transducer. The mechanical energy is transformed back into electrical and the returning echo is then plotted on the screen with relationship to time and intensity. Now, if we think about sonar, which is an acronym that stands for sound navigation and ranging, the vessels that had the sonar capability knew precisely when that pulse was generated. It knew which medium it was traveling, and because it knew the medium, it knew the speed of sound within that medium. It also knew how long it took for that echo information to return. Based upon that information, it could calculate the distance to the reflective target. So if we take that information and loosely apply it to diagnostic ultrasound, the ultrasound system knows exactly when that pulse was generated. It knows that it's traveling through human soft tissue at body temperature, so therefore it knows the speed, and it knows how long it took for that return echo information to get back to its source. So therefore, if we calculate the time that it took for that return echo to get back to the transducer, time is actually equal to distance. So echoes that are deeper within the field will appear farther away from the transducer. The term echogenicity is one of the ways that we describe the ultrasound image. If the area of interest is more echogenic than the surrounding tissue, it is said to be hyperechoic. Conversely, if the area of interest is less echogenic, it is said to be hypoechoic. The next is a little more challenging. If the area of interest has the same echogenicity as the surrounding tissue, it is said to be isoechoic. And lastly, if there is an absence of echoes, it is said to be anechoic. Typically, fluid-filled structures will appear anechoic on the screen. This is, of course, providing we have our controls set correctly. Now the scanning planes that are employed in diagnostic ultrasound would generally be considered longitudinal or sagittal when the transducer is oriented along the long axis of the patient's body. Transverse would be when we turn that transducer 90 degrees so that we would now see the cross-sectional view of that anatomical structure. And when the transducer is brought in from the side, it's said to be in a coronal imaging plane. So things that are closest to the transducer would appear more lateral. Things that are farthest away from the transducer will appear more medial. Transducer orientation is key to our success. There's an identification mark on the transducer. In this particular case, it's an orange dot. 
that identifying mark on the transducer must correspond to the correct identification orientation that is listed on the screen. So to understand where the correct orientation mark is on the screen, the first thing we will do is to select the desired application. In this particular case, we will select abdomen. Once the abdominal application is selected, you will notice that there is an identifying mark, which is in fact the Echinos logo. The logo appears on the left-hand side of the sector image when you are performing an abdominal examination. In a longitudinal or sagittal imaging transducer orientation, the orange dot on the torso or transducer is oriented toward the patient's head. By convention, this now allows for a standardized display of our imaging orientation, whereby the left side of the image is representative of anatomy toward the patient's head, and the right side is representative towards their feet. If we now take the transducer and rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise, the orange dot orientation mark on the transducer is now positioned toward the patient's right side, and we can now visualize the same anatomy in the third dimension. The orientation of this image is similar to a cross-sectional view on a CT scan, whereby you visualize the patient's right and left sides. Their head is up and beyond this image, and we are standing at their feet looking up inside them. There should already be an expectation upon the operator that when you move the transducer on the patient, which side of the screen will come into your field of view and which side will be leaving your field of view. If, however, we incorrectly rotate the transducer so the orange dot is pointed toward the patient's left side, our right to left orientation is now reversed and our displayed anatomy must also be reversed. If, however, we select a different imaging application, it is possible our screen orientation mark may also change. In this example, when the heart application is selected, you will notice the Echinos logo referenced earlier now appears on the right-hand side of the sector. This occurs by default, and we must adjust our transducer orientation accordingly to ensure a standardized view and correct anatomical orientation are maintained. Let's discuss why frequency matters in diagnostic ultrasound. Lower frequencies offer enhanced penetration capabilities to visualize deeper structures. Lower frequencies are employed when visualizing cardiac and abdominal structures, for example. Higher frequencies offer increased resolving capabilities, but sacrifice the penetration advantages as compared to lower frequencies. Higher frequency technology is generally used to visualize superficial structures when penetration is less of a concern. From the moment the sound is generated, it starts to weaken. That progressive weakening of the sound beam is called attenuation. This is one of the reasons why we use gel as an interface between the surface of the transducer and the patient's skin. If we didn't do that, there would be an air interface and sound does not travel well through air. Now the attenuation occurs in several different forms we should become familiar with. The first is reflection. We like this. We want this to happen. We want the sound to simply go and strike something and come right back to the transducer to be registered, much like you would be shining a flashlight directly into a mirror. Ultrasound imaging does a very good job when it hits the interface at 90 degrees or very close to it. The next is scatter where the signal can be reflected in multiple directions. Some of that scatter may not make it back to the transducer to be registered. The next is refraction, where there's a redirection of part of the sound beam. And the last is absorption, most of which is converted to heat. Now, this actually forms the foundation for therapeutic ultrasound, which is in a different frequency range than diagnostic work is. One key point to remember is that sound continues to weaken on its round trip to and from the transducer. So this is a progressive process as the sound travels not only into the patient, but as it comes back to the transducer to be registered.
There are several controls that can help us with the attenuation of the acoustic signal. The first is called body type. It has three settings, small, medium, and large. When this control is adjusted, the transmit frequency is either raised or lowered, depending upon which selection you employ, as well as the receive frequencies or the level of harmonics that the system will use to interpret the receive side of the signal. The next two controls also assist with compensating for the attenuation of the signal. Remember, these are receiver controls and do not control the output signal of the transducer. The first is called TGC, or Time Gain Compensation. As the name would suggest, it compensates for the additional time the signal took to travel to and from deeper structures as compared to those that had a shorter round-trip travel distance. In essence, the control amplifies returning echoes relative to depth. The goal is to have the returning echoes displayed of equal intensity regardless of depth. The next control is called gain. It acts similar to a volume control or loudness of the acoustic signal. It amplifies returning echoes equally no matter where they occur. One of the errors often made is to begin with the gain too high and then using the TGC to suppress the signals. It is important to remember these controls work in conjunction with one another. Another control in the user interface is called depth. This is our field of view or how much we can see into the patient from the top of the screen to the bottom. And it's measured in sonometers. Be sure to maximize the field of view with the area of interest being displayed in approximately the middle third of the viewing display while also being careful not to omit deeper structures because we have the control set too shallow. Next, we will review the various ultrasound modes available on Cosmos. The first is B mode or brightness mode. This is the picture mode. Ultrasound is uniquely designed to view soft tissue organs for their assessment of size, shape, symmetry, their echogenicity, anatomical relationships to other structures, and any associated vascularity or pathology. The next is M mode or motion over time along a chosen line. M mode is often used in cardiac assessments to allow quantitative measurements of valve motion, chamber sizes, aortic root size, wall thickness, ventricular motion, and more. Color and spectral Doppler are available on the Cosmos system. Doppler, including color, provides information relating to blood flow in its direction relative to the transducer position. Generally speaking, once color is selected, we examine the position of the color scale bars. In this example, flow towards the transducer appear in the red and yellow color scale, while flow away from the transducer appear in shades of blue. It is not a visual representation of arterial versus venous flow. It is important to remember color Doppler determines frequency shift between transmitted sound and reflection of moving blood. It encodes the shift information into color using the mean velocity data. Please remember to use the smallest color or sample box size to interrogate the area of interest to maximize system performance and frame rate. Like color Doppler, spectral Doppler determines the frequency shift between the transmitted sound and the reflection of moving blood. It encodes the shift information into a waveform and displays the flow data in its direction relative to the transducer. It also allows for quantitative information to be obtained. Cosmos has both pulsed wave and continuous wave Doppler technologies. We need to remember that ultrasound is energy. While ultrasound is generally considered to be safe with low risks, the risks may increase with unnecessary or prolonged exposure to ultrasound energy or when safety practices are not employed. A fundamental approach to the safe use of diagnostic ultrasound begins with the ALARA principle. The term ALARA is an acronym that stands for as low as reasonably achievable. The American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine has numerous publications that may be reviewed for further information. 
to assist us in practicing the Alara principle and the prudent use of ultrasound. On-screen values are displayed to include the MI or mechanical index and TI or thermal index. The mechanical index is a measure of acoustic power and provides the operator information about the magnitude of energy administered to a patient during a sonographic examination. The TI or thermal index relates to the absorption of sound waves that may cause heating in tissue. It's intended as a measure of an ultrasound beam's thermal bio effects. A working knowledge of MI and TI is encouraged. Additional details regarding these measurement parameters may again be reviewed in the various AIUM publications. Keys to success for ultrasound imaging include selecting the appropriate imaging application, use the correct transducer orientation, keep the area of interest in the screen center, and be certain to maximize the system controls to include the body type, depth, TGC, gain, and be mindful of the MI and TI values. Thank you for viewing Ultrasound Simplified.